Good evening, everybody. This session is called Islamist Terror, the New Normal. It's the last of a series of uh, panel debates that have been going on in this room called Eye on the World, supported by the Foreign Press Association, very much with a view to kind of having a sense of where we are internationally. And obviously, on an issue like Islamist Terror, this is an, both an international issue, but one that's had uh, very serious implications um, both in, in the UK, in Europe, and is sort of resonates throughout the world. We've had a lot of debates um, over the years at this festival on uh, the new terrorism, on why young people join ISIS. And I kind of half felt that maybe we didn't need to have another one this year. Maybe, you know, maybe what would, more would there be to say, or would it be a bit samey? But I was actually talking to um, a, a colleague, Sheila, in, in, in um, uh, Salford, and she said, after the Manchester bombing, she said, well, you know, the only thing is, is that are we just going to have to accept this as the new normal? And she made the point that after the Manchester bombing, that there was all of these kind of rituals and online profile changes and hashtags and candlelit vigils and uh, all of these kind of things going on. And she just didn't feel that it was a satisfactory response to the, uh, to the rise of Islamist terror, and that, in fact, it, it kind of muted any proper discussion on it. So um, I, I'm glad that I talked to Sheila because she encouraged me to organize this discussion. So let me just introduce our two speakers. Emma El Badawi, a political and social scientist who specializes in the Middle East, in Islamist terrorism and Salafi jihadi networks. The head of research at Tony Blair's Institute for Global Change. Emma is a British Egyptian, born and lived in Saudi Arabia before permanently moving to the UK. It's her first time at the Battle of Ideas. Can we give her a very warm welcome, please? And, and then we're going to get some thoughts from Professor Frank Faraday, sociologist and social commentator. His latest book, Populism and the European Culture Wars, which I recommend you all read, was the opening keynote theme. And has also he's been involved in a variety of debates throughout the festival. He's also the author of Invitation to Terror, Expanding the Empire of the Unknown, which in some ways anticipated some of the ways that these debates would play themselves out when it came out some years ago. And so can we welcome Frank back, as it were. <laughs> and they're, they're both going to introduce some opening thoughts. And I've got a few questions I'll ask them, but I'm really keen to get your, just let's have this, let's have it out, as it were, about this issue. It, 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 one, of, one of the things that I think needs to be said is, or needs to be queried is, is this a situation we just have to get used to? There'll be Islamist terror, nothing we can do about it. And in the populism debate that Frank did, somebody raised the example of the Football Lads Alliance who'd organised a big march through London saying that they weren't prepared to accept this rise of Islamist terror. And it was interesting that the media both ignored that on the one hand, or those that did comment said it was the rise of right-wing populism um, on the streets of London. So I think it's worth us considering uh, whether that was a worthwhile response, how we should respond, should we just hashtag it, or can we discuss it more fruitfully? Emma, give us your thoughts, please. Well, on this subject, I always find it really surreal how um, familiar terms like Islamism and jihadism, caliphate, are now in our lexicon among British citizens. And it really strikes me because these words have become so heavily used with connotations and understanding that all British citizens seem to understand it when it's written in our newspapers. And if you compare how terrorism and terrorist acts are covered in the media now to, say, for instance, 9-11, even before 9-11, it really has changed. And the nuances of terminology has uh, improved, which has in some ways reflected how almost everyone now has an informed opinion on Islamism and terrorism because I think it matters to almost everyone and they have a stake to want to understand what's this massive threat on their everyday life. I think to start off with, what I want to say is, in my view, there is absolutely nothing normal about these attacks that are happening and making our headlines so regularly. That said, they are becoming all too familiar. And that's the difference. It's not about normality, it's about familiarity, perhaps. Ramming cars into innocent civilians may be the newest trend. But for people like myself who are committed to try to understand what starts off all of these attacks, 
the first question we have to ask is how are so many of our British Muslims, if we're thinking about homegrown terrorism, being turned against the country that they were raised in and grew up in? And, you know, to be honest with you, as a British citizen, as a Muslim um, with mixed heritage, I've taken it on for myself as not just a professional need to understand this, but also a personal need as well. Um, and in my years of working to counter extremism, I actually have found that no answers actually satisfy. Because in so many of these things, if we have answers, it becomes a rational response to things going on in the world. And so if an answer was to be satisfactory, then it would be saying that this is all rational reactions to, to things that we're experiencing today. That said, I have committed myself to try to understand this issue. And my first conclusion I want to start with, and I hope that through the discussions we'll be able to uh, bring out the nuances and what I really mean by this. But the first conclusion is, broadly speaking, um, that all people, like, like all people, young British Muslims and young Muslims all around the world, are influenced by their social circle. Family, neighbors, uh, friends, colleagues, Radicalization is a social process. And it's often when you trace back the individuals who have done attacks around the world, in the UK including, it is so often easy to trace back a network of individuals that they were in touch with. And contrary to theories of lone wolf terrorism, which many of you will have heard of, radicalization terrorism is so rarely the result of a reclusive lifestyle. Whether their point of contact is online or offline, they are connected to one another. And don't doubt the fact that this global jihadi movement has been shaped by those very personal links and the camaraderie that has driven this organization and all of these different groups to become global threats. The social dynamics among terrorists today has meant that today's radicalization has really taken on a pace of its own. And so our response has therefore been even more urgent. But it really does originate from a decades-long perfected message that has been orchestrated through a propaganda machine and that we have yet to effectively counter. Drawing authenticity from Islam's doctrinal texts, recruiters have, sometimes masterfully, woven an ultra-simplistic version of Islam or an interpretation of Islam with a dynamic and constantly adapting narrative of grievance and scapegoating. And then, through it, they give a mandate to kill by identifying victims through our society. Their target audience is, is almost exclusively towards the generation of Muslim youth who have only really ever seen a spotlight on their faith a faith and identity they often reject, albeit how awkward that is, but they very rarely all out abandon it. And it's that point that they manage to capitalize on, that dormant identity that makes you slightly different to someone around you by being a Muslim, because it was imposed on you or whether it's because you adopted it later <coughs> on, it becomes something that's important to you and they capitalize on that. A young person doesn't need to read propaganda of ISIS or Al-Qaeda anymore to know what the message is. Believe it or not, most young Muslims today are learning more about their religious identity and the perversions of it through our national newspapers than through their local imams. And knowledge of their faith is superficial at best. In my view, a future without terrorism will crucially require a correction of this ignorance within Islam. It is our own lack of knowledge, I mean the Muslims, of our faith that enables this perverse version of Islam to fester on and influence so many of our youth. Ultimately, ultimately though, the success for the extremists who radicalize these young men and women is that they arm them with a sense of conviction. And that conviction is probably for me the most important part of countering terrorism. It's what gives them that sense that what they're doing, the violence, is honorable. And without that conviction, someone may not mobilize and start to kill innocent civilians. And I can pretty much bet my entire life on it that a man that has any doubt in what he's doing is honorable 
would probably not ram his car into innocent children or indeed encourage someone else to do so. And it's that that I need to focus on. I don't think that our counter-extremism efforts currently recognize the power of conviction in the ideological process of recruiting someone to terrorism. I hope that we'll be able to elaborate on this a little bit more um, and try to understand the minds of somebody that becomes a threat to society in this way. Uh, but I want to leave you with that. For me, there are three areas. If you imagine a Venn diagram, there are three core areas that you can really simplify this. It's identity being one. So one circle being identity. That can be a fixation of your identity, a desire to express your identity in everything you do. Not everyone has that, but some people do. Some people, their identity informs how they participate in society, how they have empathy towards others. It, it dictates it in every part of their life. The, third, the second one being strains, grievances. And these aren't necessarily real grievances. They are perceived sometimes. And they're often grievances or strains that are so hard to address through conventional channels. And so it quickly becomes something that is out of control, that you start to think of new ways to counter those issues in your life. And other things like violence become viable options to, to counter those strains. And then thirdly, and I think this is the missing ingredient, is what I've already mentioned, conviction. Without that final ingredient, someone is less likely to become mobilized. With identity issues and with strains or grievances, you might become an antisocial person in society, but you'll very rarely end up doing a deadly act. It's that conviction, that belief that you've got the truth and everyone else is wrong, that you can see the light and everyone else is trivial and their lives are just a waste of time. That makes you do that act. And you have to believe that what you're doing, you're going to be remembered in positive ways and also be fighting for a cause that's much bigger than you. And so those three, conviction, identity, and strain, are for me the most important ingredients to this. Frank, your thoughts, please. Yeah, I'm really just going to talk about the uh, homegrown aspect of uh, what I see as being a kind of radical Islamist reaction rather than the global one, because I think the context within Europe uh, for this kind of development is very, a little bit different than it would be in the Middle East or in North Africa or elsewhere. I mean, I've kind of struggled with this question for, uh, for some time now. I first became aware of what I saw as a big problem it was uh, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 when uh, I realized, came to my attention to talking to people that a significant section of, uh, of the Muslim population actually regarded as, uh, the destruction of the World Trade Center as unbalanced, a positive result, uh, rather than being kind of horrified. It wasn't a majority opinion by any means, but a significant minority, maybe a, a significant minority of a minority, reacted in that way. And when I began to hear that, I became very interested as to understand what was really going on. One of the things I tried to do, I, I, I got involved working with uh, other colleagues, you know, doing some research on you know, what was going on, you know, what was the uh, basis for some of these domestic responses, was to begin to uh, look at some research that some people were carrying out, which compared the way in which uh, people in certain communities of North reacted to uh, everyday events, and we, we we looked at uh, the response of white working class young people to the world around them and also to the response of young Muslim people to the world around them. And what's very fascinating about the, uh, the discussion that we had was that the reaction that they had to the same phenomenon were almost diametrically opposite. So the white working class kids would think that the Muslim population was getting all the housing, they were all getting all the easy access, they were getting all the welfare benefits, and that was unfair. Whereas when you talk to the young Muslim kids, that they would be saying pretty much the same thing. The white working class was privileged. They, they were getting access to resources in an unfair way, uh, which, which, which the other section didn't get. And there that we obviously found out was that whereas you know, the, the white working class kids were saying that the police and uh, the authorities were protecting the Muslims, and in a way that kind of was a double standard, so you had the other way around kind of reaction where so the Muslim uh, kids were saying the police is always backing the white working class. It's very unfair, and it's very much discriminating 
I think that kind of context was very interesting for me because it made me realize something that I, I think I should have known better as a sociologist was that for a variety of reasons we had this, we had kind of created a segmented uh, sort of world where you had very polarized views existing within the same geographical space, <coughs> but bet uh, between uh, and, and, and between different kind of cultures, uh, uh, a very different uh, view of the world that was evolving right in the midst of our society, and it wasn't at that point that politicized. These you know these people that I'm talking about weren't going to Syria then. It wasn't the case that they had become radicalized in the way that would occur later on. But what I'm trying to say, there's already a kind of a predisposition to interpret the worst about the society that you were living in. I mean, that's what struck me as being very, and when I went to Holland or Belgium, places like that, you find a very similar patterns were uh, coming to the surface, where a significant section of the Muslim immigrant population did regard the, the society that they lived in as not theirs. They were something that they were quite alienated from. And I think that was, to me, the first uh, uh, important step, the most important thing to kind of understand. Because it seems to me that uh, whatever theory of radicalization we interpret, whatever uh, sort of theory we adopt in terms of what's really going on, and I think a lot of the radicalization arguments are, are just wrong, you know, just basically uh, miss the whole point altogether. For example, there's a, a very fashionable theory of radicalization that suggests that people who are vulnerable, the weakest, the most powerless, are the ones that get drawn into that. Whereas all the research, all the evidence indicates that actually the ones that are drawn towards radicalization tend to be a bit more idealistic, tend to be a bit more, um, uh, a bit more agency than you would suspect. And, and very often people who are pretty much uh, leaders or potential leaders uh, within their own community. So I think that, uh, you know, we're not talking about the people that get radicalized, but I think what we're really interested in is what is it that creates a certain fertile terrain within which a minority of a minority could make decisions about going to Syria or could decide to uh, undertake a, a violent terrorist act. In other words, what is it in that milieu you know, what is it within society that kind of creates that? And I think there's a number of different elements to it. I don't want to go at the specifically uh, sort of cultural and community elements. And I think that some of the points that Emma was making is absolutely right. All the work that I've seen demonstrates that uh, people who uh, sort of get involved in terrorist acts have got friends who got involved in it. They've got uh, clan members that got involved in it. it, it there's a kind of you know, small network of individuals who all reinforce one another. I think that that, that seems to be uh, incontrovertible in terms of the, this, this, the evidence that we have available to us. But I think there's a, a, a more fundamental problem for British society, which is that you know, for every individual that goes to Syria, every individual that, that gets more terrorism, there's actually a, a, a large number of individuals to kind of passively regard that in a positive way a large section of society who they themselves would not be uh, drawn towards undertaking those kinds of acts. Nevertheless, think that on balance, these uh, people who uh, are making, uh, uh, visiting Syria or going somewhere else to fight for jihad are on balance morally superior or, or can have a kind of moral authority uh, compared to the rest of society. I think that's what I find to be uh, a little bit disturbing, and that, that's what needs to be unpacked. Now, why is that? It seems to me that <coughs> there are two reasons uh, that, are, that are at work here, and both of them are very, very tricky. I think that one, one of the first reasons why this occurs is because, by and large, what we're seeing is the emergence of uh, the politicization of identity. And I think that the politicization of uh, Islamist identity has got to be seen not just simply as a as, as something that's internal to the, within the Islamic world, I think the politicization of identity is something that exists within all Western societies. And, and, and you have not just simply people drawn towards uh, Islamic radicalism that are involved in that, but also a large number of youth cultures or subcultures within European society. The very fact that identity has become so important, as seen as so important, has become the medium to which so much of our political dialogue takes place is something that is there. And it just so happens that one version of that identity politics 
uh, which we, what we're discussing uh, today, as a more lethal, more violent, and potentially a more globally harmful kind of consequence of that. So that's the first uh, element that I think uh, uh, needs to be uh, taken on board. The second element, we have to ask, well, why is identity politics so important, and why does identity politics acquire such a lethal, destructive kind of dimension in certain cases? And I think the answer to that, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is lies within the way that British society and European societies on balance tend to organize themselves. And I'm thinking principally about multiculturalism. Now, I know that multiculturalism has got the best of intentions. It, it's kind of guided by an impulse of being fair and equit equi equitable. But I think that what multiculturalism has become over the years is one where the multi takes on a great significance, where the, the many uh, acquires a dynamic of its own, and where multiculturalism has resulted in a situation where cultural segmentation, and then, in some cases, cultural segregation, has acquired a certain degree of authority. We have a situation where, uh, because European societies no longer seem to think that assimilation is a good thing, no longer have the resources, the moral, the intellectual, the political resources, to find ways uh, of developing strong bonds between different types of people, where we've given up on the fact that it's quite important that we have a very a, a clear clarity about what are the cultures that we share, what is it that we kind of sign up to. One of the things that we have is that we have no account of, for example, what it means to be British, or what it means to be French, or what it means to be Dutch. In other words, you know, we haven't got a very clear pole of attraction to which we can draw people from different backgrounds to a, a, to a same common way of looking at things. And I think that, uh, that to me, is, is really quite important, because if you haven't got a kind, of, uh, sort of, uh, a kind of moral center to the communities that we live in, if we haven't got the, the cementing influences <coughs> of culture that kind of uh, make us and, and, and kind of sign us up to a common theme, a common narrative, then you are always going to be in a situation where people will feel alienated and estranged, where they will be looking for ways of giving meaning to their identities in a way that is separate from the community within which they live, but also, in many instances, uh, quite alien and hostile to it. And I think that one of the things that we have to recognize is that for a, a significant section of society, there is a, a much greater meaning to be found within a, a counter-cultural Islamic kind of way of looking at things than it is in terms of what Western societies are offering them. And that's the, the tragedy that we have uh, to kind of confront, that we have created a world where many European societies haven't got a, 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 an ability to actually give a sense of coherence to, to, to their society, and where they've allowed a situation where people are able to go off in different uh, trajectories and often find themselves in a very alien, estranged, and potentially quite violent territory. Now that's what I'm really arguing, is that if you are going to have such a fragmented uh, sort of moral space being created in our society, there really isn't anything within British society that can act as an antidote, as a cultural or as a moral antidote to the kind of radicalist propaganda that are, is often available to young people. And I've listened to uh, a fair number of jihadist videos, of, of a fair number of these jihadist you know, sort of websites, and they are actually quite compelling. I mean, if you look, at them, they are projecting and they're putting forward a very clear, not compelling to me, but, but <laughs> in the sense that they are putting forward a very clear moral message, which isn't being uh, sort of countered by anything very clear and very obvious to me. And therefore, I have kind of drawn the negative conclusion that until we fix the problems within British society itself, until we begin to address what it is that kind of binds us together. In other words, until we deal with the values questions that are quite fundamental to our way of life, until we tackle that, this problem of radicalization is not going to go away. And I, what I mean by radicalization isn't just the current form, but also any future form that might emerge uh, amongst other communities uh, in the late latter part of the 21st century. Okay. Emma, just quickly, if you have any responses, but a couple of things I wanted to ask you in relation to Frank.
was just that point about the kind of crisis of values and the politicisation of identity. It kind of touched on your side, but, but do you recognise that or is there anything you slightly disagree with? And the other thing to ask you, and it's something I'll come back to Frank on as well before going out to the audience, is one of the things that which is often said is that you know, it's hard to have this conversation because you get accused of Islamophobia and so on. Um, and that there's a sort of, but, that, but, but I, don't, I don't even know if that's true. There seems to be a shying away from this conversation um, in British society. It might be happening in counter-terrorism circles, but it's not as though everyone feels the need or feels, feels the confidence to be able to actually take it on head on. That seems to me to be really problematic for young Muslims, for young British, whether they're Muslim or not. In fact, that you can't have the frank conversation. Do you recognise that too? But anything you want to say anyway, yeah. I recognise both, actually. Um, I recognise the difficulty in having frank conversations around this. Um, I think, in general, the term Islamophobia has been slightly unpopular on both sides, I think. Muslims find it frustrating that... I think, I think Muslims are, right now, on the defensive. I think, and as a result, a lot of the average Muslim that's not engaged um, from a, in a professional or even a personal basis in the fight against extremism of Islam, I think they do feel a little bit frustrated that their, vo that their voices are being drowned out as moderates um, by people who are much more vocal and loud and extreme. And they kind of perhaps feel like it's a bit futile and a bit sort of what's the point of trying to keep saying that Islam is peace, which is what you always hear because it's not resonating and because you know, the evidence on the ground doesn't seem to support it for people who are not familiar with uh, the beliefs in Islam. And so I think in general that's created a bit of a deadlock in any sort of fruitful conversation because where you've got two parties that have conviction either side, it's very difficult to find a sort of a, a constructive way forward. And I think for those people who are afraid of Islamophobia, yeah, I do agree that it becomes very difficult to to be armed with the right word so you don't look racist. I guess that's where being more informed allows you to know where the responsibilities lie and how far those responsibilities lie for the wide Muslim communities. Um, on the values point, I, um, I, I actually agree with Frank. I think values, values on the jihadi side are really important. Um, I have studied the propaganda, and I can tell you values are probably the most important thing that comes out of all their propaganda. It doesn't matter what group, even ISIS. ISIS are so often just seen as this death cult, that just their only value is blood and murder. And actually, as uncomfortable as it sounds, a lot of their values that they promote in their propaganda for their supporters are positive values, and they're actually scarily universal values. You've got very um, clear Islamic creedal values in them, which are very important for them because that's what gets their credibility and authenticity to their audience. But actually, probably more um, explicit are the more universal values like honor and solidarity and pride. And all of these things, uh, one of the things I always find as well is emotion. They're very good at triggering emotion. I think that's what Frank means by compelling because I think we've become quite an emotionless society, and we're not very good at raising positive emotions amongst uh, us. So things like hope and dignity, that's a big thing in jihadi propaganda. And we often neglect that because we think that people should have hope and dignity, and w our current system certainly supports that structurally for good jobs and salaries, and et cetera. But actually, that can be a lot more spiritual, and, and jihadis are very good at using that and, and really triggering those emotions. Um, I think we need, to, we need to be more explicit about what values Britain is proud of. We also need to be slightly more reflective on, if we're talking about universal values, where do those universal values come from? What cultures dictate those universal values? Are we share, do we share values across the West? I mean, the jihadis like to lump us all as the West. And that's really, it's, it's easy for them because they can say the West is debauched and the West has no proper values. Um, and it's a really easy way to enemize people, pe make people enemies. Um, but I actually think we need to, we need to know that 
and we need to communicate that Western values are not just one big block. We have different values to Americans, for example. We have different values to other Europeans. And so that, I think we have to hold on to that complexity because that complexity is actually what makes us different. If we try to push for a universal set of values, I actually wonder whether we'll end up losing that fight a little bit because we'll lose that complexity and that individuality that we're trying to promote. One of the things you'll notice with jihadis is that they'll take on lots of, sorry, I'll, um, I'll, I'll carry on a little bit later. Uh, sorry, sorry, just because just, just I want to go out to the audience. Yeah, so very quick, Frank. Yeah, I mean, just carrying on from what Emma was saying, the interesting thing is, is that some of the values that are, are being promoted or, or argued for are values that I really like. You know, like courage. It used to be a very important value in, in the West. We lost it. I mean, how often do you see courage being upheld uh, in the 21st century? We talk about survival. We talk about all kinds of other things. Duty, responsibility. I mean, these are all important. Honor. I mean, these are all, to me, quite fundamental values that British society finds very difficult uh, to kind of give meaning to and stutters around it. And I think that there is a kind of problem here that uh, we on our, our side are very reluctant to give expression to that. And that, that is why you have a situation where when a bomb goes off in Manchester or, or in London, the immediate response is, oh, it's not, the response isn't, oh my God, it's a real blow that we had, isn't this really horrible? The reaction is, oh, I'm really worried about uh, Islamophobia, you know, the reaction that's going to occur. That's the way we, and, and there's a kind of embarrassment about it, and a kind of a, a, an inability to say, well, actually, let's fight back. Let's do something really decisive. Let's use the values of honor, courage, and responsibility in a positive way. If they look at the police force, what the, the uh, advice they give to people when there's a terrorist attack, it's about fleeing, about hiding, maybe calling us. but. No, it, there isn't a, a, a word for fighting back. In America, at least, there is fleeing, you know, but then there's also a call to fight back as being really quite important. Let me give you an example just to end this. Happened to me personally. In my university, they invited a jihadist speaker to give a talk, and, it, and the speaker was banned. And I wrote a, a, a letter in the newspaper, and I give a, did a radio program saying it's a mistake because here was an opportunity for people to argue against this person and win the hearts and minds of the students, particularly the Muslim students on campus, by having the debate out. I got a, a letter ne next day from the pro-vice chancellor of the university saying, Frank, I, I think you're probably right, it's a free speech issue, but we can't find anybody to argue against him. You know, would you be willing to come and argue? <laughs> and I thought that was really, really sad, because here I'm, I'm a relatively old guy, you know, so that I'm not a, a kind of a campus figure, you know, going around. And he can't, and, and instead of finding somebody to argue back and, 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 and seeing that as a, as a matter of honor that we've got a democratic way of life to defend and to uphold, instead you look for a bureaucratic solution and pretend the problem isn't really there. And I think that kind of summed up the problem <coughs> for me. Okay, um, I'm going to go out to the audience. One, one query that I'll, I'll come back to Emma and Frank on, actually, is that, because one, one of the things about politicized I identity is, is that actually it isn't very courageous, it hasn't got much honor, and it kind of plays the kind of whinging victim card. So only because I, I don't want it to end up that kind of, God, ISIS have got a better value system than we have. Okay. Uh, as a con <laughs> Ball of ideas, message, takeaway. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> you want a bit of courage, <laughs> jihadi website near you. Yeah, so... Um, <coughs> But, it, but it's genuinely not my experience. I mean, I, I get, I understand it a bit, but I actually found that those young people, when I've given lectures, I mean, you know, I've written about this, but when I've spoken and those young people who've been sympathetic to the Ummah in a way where they would say, oh, of course, I think it's terrible what ISIS do, but I just think that what they're doing is trying to explain what I feel, which is as a victim and so on and so forth. But, you know, they, 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 they are kind of like, is like it, you know, jihadi social justice warriors rather than uh, uh, anything. I mean, it's kind of, you've got that side to it too. Uh, it's kind of very, it's, it's almost indistinct from other young people who say similar things around their own particular. So I wondered if you can recognize any of that. Anyway, out to the audience. Firstly, on the values point, I guess the obvious points raised is that seemingly values have disappeared from our sphere with the death of Christianity in our country. I certainly don't want that back, and I don't know what, if anything, we could suggest that wouldn't destroy liberalism that we could have as an alternative. Um, secondly, I know Frank briefly touched on the idea of Islam as a counterculture. 
And I just wondered whether so something like that is quite important in the fact that a lot of young men in particular are attracted to it, that it is kind of rebellious, it's kind of edgy, it's the only thing left that is still truly offensive and shocking and dangerous really to our culture is a death cult. And on a similar note, are these people really that different from the sort of people who would have joined, I guess, uh, Bader Meinhof or something back in the 1970s? It's a similar phenomenon. I oh, yeah. I'm in the field of comedy, which is populated by cowards. And uh, my, uh, my landlord is a, I, I, I'm not, he's a Muslim. And one night we were riffing and he comes out and he starts talking about religion. He, he doesn't know what my religious background is, if I have any at all. First off, I applaud your honesty and your courage for being here. Um, and he's, he just, he's describing the Ummah and this vision of uh, Islam eventually dominating the world and uh, the president one day will be a Muslim and all this. But he's not saying this in like a hate speech or, or a hate jihadi video tone. It's said with a smile. And it reminded me of the small town Christians I grew up with, like the days of the rapture and the end of days and all that stuff. And it just, it, it got me to think, I went back and you know, I saw some video on YouTube about 72 genders and I thought, of course we're gonna convert. It just seemed like, you know, that's gonna happen. What, what else do we have to uh, fall back on? But how important is the principle of ridicule in, as you say, stripping them of this honor? And should uh, satirists and comedians step up and uh, do something about it? Okay, very <laughs> Okay. So I've got a question actually also about the values. So Emma, you mentioned that, for example, the Islamist propaganda talks about honor and solidarity as a very important value for them. And at the same time that we start missing set of our own values. However, I feel that honor and solidarity are as strong values in the West as they are important for the Islamists. And then to what Frank said, you know, there were two groups of young people that you asked what are their concerns with the, with how they feel about the uh, society that they live in. And both of the groups, the young working class yard lads said, oh, you know, everyone is stealing our job and it's very unfair. And the, the same <coughs> s information came back from the Muslim group. So my question is, you know, the young working class lads didn't end up roaming <coughs> the streets with vans. So what is it about Islam? that makes people think that it's honorable to kill people. And then another point that I wanted to make was quickly, that, please. Yes, that um, in the introduction it was mentioned that maybe we should limit our freedoms to prevent further terrorism. I think terrorism is, the goal is to prevent our freedoms. They're attacking young women on the night out. I think the last thing we should be doing is to limit our freedoms ourselves because this is what they want. So to my understanding, jihad in the Quran is actually to do with an internal struggle against one's own um, temptations and lusts and things. And that's been sort of extrapolated and perhaps perverted into this almost justification for violence. And I, I was going to ask whether you think that's something that's been done by themselves in the East and that's a, a proudness to label themselves as jihads or if that's something that the West has done and we should be avoiding it. I will commend the, the point made that we should be more courageous and we should encourage uh, the idea of courage in the face of this adversity. Um, though I would ask that when we say action, to take action, you know, that the things they write on, this, on, on notices, what to do in case of terrorist attacks, I find myself struggling to find an answer there. I can't it's difficult to say you should run at the truck, or I, I find no concrete way to channel that courage, because we as a society can come together and be courageous, but what do we do with that? We need something concrete to work against this sort of, yeah, adversity. To the question of courage, I'm not sure how courageous you can say jihadis are. If they believe that they're being dispatched, certainly to the top level of heaven, that's what it says in the Sunni hadith. Uh, and. ISIS as a group, how courageous are they? They fight courageously, you might say, but they're mostly on, you know, dextroamphetamine and methamphetamine. There's a huge amount of chemistry, chemicals involved in what ISIS do. Um, to understand what ISIS do, the good thing is we have the internet, the good and bad thing. You can find out what ISIS's strategy is. There's a document written by a jihadist, nameless jihadist, maybe it's attributed to uh, Abu Bakr, um, uh, let's see, it would be um, 
uh, Abu Yahya al-Libi, uh, an al-Qaeda ideologue that documents called The Management of Savagery, and basically talks about how it is that the deliberate creation of chaos is what chooses people, uh, uh, compels people to flee to certainty. That's the idea, and that's kind of inherent in the jihadi creed, that creating chaos will compel people to flee to the certainty of Islam. Uh, this idea that jihad... So very quickly now, quick, quick, quick. The idea that jihad mainly refers to an inner struggle is just false in the Quran. It mainly refers to warfare overwhelmingly, and in the Hadith literature also. In fact, uh, Aisha, uh, Muhammad's wife, says that she wants to join Muhammad in the jihad, and he says the jihad for women is the hajj. But that's all over the Hadith. You can read uh, uh, Abdul Azam and lots of preachers. Uh, and that's my okay, question, that's no, that's is how, no, do you, no. how do you defang that narrative, which can be so sort of literally read from the literature? Okay. How do you counter it? Just mention on the jihad aspect, um, I agree with the young lady over there, um, actually, that jihad, by in terms of mainstream interpretation, and obviously that's come from a long-term consensus, you take the meaning of jihad, which comes from the Arabic jahada, which is the root of the word, and that means struggle. And struggle can be interpreted, interpreted by people practicing that in both a spiritual sense as well as a, a physical sense, and physical would be, be violence. The main aspect um, that is for ideologues within al-Qaeda initially and then later on now ISIS is the question of how much is jihad actually justifiable today? That is the real question, is obviously all Muslims who read the Quran, they, be they believe that jihad is justifiable in certain contexts, but armed jihad. Now, for ideologues, they say that typically, jihad is justifiable for defense. And so when they're communicating that to prospective followers, they crucially have to make sure that whoever's listening believes that they are defending themselves, because that's where it's legitimate in modern day offensive jihad becomes a lot harder to justify. And it, it has always been um, a bit of a contentious issue even within jihadi groups. And so th there, are, there are lots of different, different groups that, um, there that dis distinguish themselves based on defensive jihad. So for example, if they're thrown into a civil war, you'll see a lot more armed groups coming based on the sense of defensive jihad. Al-Qaeda and ISIS differ differentiate between classical jihad, which is defensive jihad, because they are expansionist. And so therefore, by default, they are offensive, okay? And, th and, th and there's, there's internal debate even within there. So actually, when we're talking about jihadism, we actually don't really appreciate that the internal dialogue that's happening against other groups is extremely competitive. And actually, that's one of the weaknesses of those groups that we don't capitalize on in the West enough. We can get a lot of ways of countering ISIS and Al-Qaeda by actually looking and appropriating the criticisms that they have internally against them among other ideologues. The other point I wanted to make actually is Mujahideen, which is the people who do jihad, the plural sense, has been used across the world, all over the world, for, for actually decades, honestly. We have, even in the West, capitalized on the concept of jihad ourselves in our fight against the Soviets in Afghanistan. With Saudi Arabia and America, they agreed that actually, you know what, the, the, the jihadis, the mujahideen, they're quite useful for us in our fight against the Soviets. So for a time in the 1980s, in 1970s, we were actually quite, we, we kind of thought they're the lesser evil. Now obviously, it grew a pace of its own and it spread in a way that we couldn't quite appreciate how easily it was to, to motivate people along those classical concepts. So I just want to mention that as well. Okay, thank you. Frank, anything you want to pick up? Uh, just on that point, the Brits used uh, jihadi against Arab nationalism in the 40s and the early 30s. So, you know, we are accomplices in, the, in this kind of global development ourselves. I, I do think there's a difference between uh, the way the uh, young Muslim radical kids react to other subcultures. And the, and the difference is that they actually believe that they are morally superior to English society. And I think that's where values become really quite important. They genuinely believe that their value system is morally superior to the slothful, corrupt, degraded outlook of, of, of Western society. <coughs> and they're not entirely wrong on the fact that you know, Western society isn't you know, the high point of human civilization when it comes to uh, kind of values. And I wasn't arguing that they're particularly courageous, but that the value of courage actually means something in, in their world in a way that it's become lost in our society. And somebody asked the question, well, what kind of values can we put forward to kind of counter that? 
And it seems to me that we have a very good system of values. They're liberal values, they're the enlightenment values, they have a tremendous amount of moral appeal. But we've got to give content and meaning to that. And I think one of the sad things has been is that Western society, British society, has become rather you know, sort of inept at giving enlightenment values any kind of real content. It's not something that we practice, we live in the way that a uh, free society ought to do that. And I think that we have to kind of have a reality check and ask the question, why is it that we're so embarrassed when we well, want to use a moral language? I mean, most of my colleagues in university, when they hear a moral language, they think that's false, it's moralistic. Only idiots talk a moral language. They imagine that only fundamentally religious people can be more, you know, have a moral world. But in fact, liberalism does have a very clear moral outlook that it can project. And one last point I want to make, it's a bit controversial. I'm probably the only person in the room that thinks that. Well, how do we fight back? What do we do? I, I mean, I've struggled with this. And aside from the fact that we do have to you know, promote the idea of fighting back when terrorist attacks occur, I think there's some very good examples of courageous behavior in some parts of Europe. And the other thing that we should be thinking about, I mean, one of the things that you know, kind of come to think about as being not a bad uh, solution, something that they've implemented in Sweden, is national service. Now, I think that national service done in an enlightened, creative way, involving both men and women uh, as a way of creating a solidarity, a, a sense of cohesion within our society, not just simply for fighting, but as a way of affirming something that we share in common may not well be, it may, may be actually a really positive thing. It will also help to solve some of our unemployment issues, <laughs> and will also perhaps, you know, sort of uh, bring the different classes together in the way that it doesn't exist because we have a very hierarchical social system in our world. Okay, so ISIS have got superior values and we're bringing in national service. The headlines are getting better, everybody. But one thing that just, just struck me when, when Frank was speaking, and I, and I appreciate the, um, that your, your expertise and your, your commitment, Emma, to the, to the um, importance of understanding the, what a jihadi means, of the terms and of these things. But, you know, it, 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 it does strike me that one thing that Frank said was, when I have talked to young Muslims who are very attracted to uh, radical Islam, they are not quite so familiar uh, uh, with the details of, um, uh, uh, in any stretch of the imagination. I sometimes feel like I know a little bit more than they do. But what they do ex have a great deal of confidence in is the moral superiority, or uh, the degeneracy of the West and the moral superiority of is, you know, as they see it, as, 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 as Islamic uh, values. And one of the things that really strikes me whenever I've kind of been on panels and discussions, and I remember one in particular where uh, uh, somebody who was unapologetically radical uh, Islamist supporter um, said, you know, the West is degenerate and the women wear short skirts and you're kind of, you know, you're destroying the planet, you're doing all these things, and kind of utter contempt dripping of him. And the professor sitting next to me said, oh, I absolutely agree with you, it's terrible, isn't it? And it was like... That wasn't of, me, by the way. No, no, it wasn't. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not the professor. But it was a leading philosophy professor. And when I said, you know, this is the outrageous, you know, Western value, you know, and that's why I use West, I said, you know, the values of the Enlightenment, liberal values, Free speech. I said, do you want me to defend your freedom? I did a rant, I ranted. And, and, uh, and the professor said, I think you're just expressing the, the, the kind of arrogance, Claire, that means that, you know, your, your, your body, the kind of arrogance of the West that has created these young people's, ex, you know, uh, attractions to Islamism. Whereas I actually thought his supine collapse in the face of that kind of description of the West was exactly what had created them. So I think there is a kind of values round to be had there that I think is worth kind of exploring further. I, I really appreciate the discussion that you're having about how to prevent Islamic terror and um, de-radicalizing people. But, I mean, hate to kill your vibe or something, but like, wasn't this discussion supposed to be about the normalization of Islamic terror? Um, and my second point is, um, I mean, like, in like, I'm I'm concerned about Islamic terror on on either side of the pond, but like, um, it ter I mean, like, I got this from the Guardian, so think of it what you may. Like that, um, there are actually way more. Um, terrorist deaths uh, by terrorism um, in Europe or America 
from political terrorists that aren't Islamists, like right-wing terror, left-wing terror, um, separatist movements. So I, I just wanted to, I, I hate to sound like the guy um, from the, the, the discussion about free speech who called for pragmatism, but like, um, shouldn't we be focusing more of our efforts on the, on the greater concern of those kinds of terrorisms? Okay, no, I mean, you, ra you, ra you, you raise, I think, both of your points are very valid, right? And it's worth saying, you know, is this a kind of fetishization of Islamist terrorism when, in fact, it's not that big a problem or it's not that serious a problem relatively and that we're actually ending up talking it up? And when you, but, but what I would say in relation to your normalization question is, I think the point about the new normal is that it's become such a new normal that you don't ever talk about it. Do you know what I mean? That's really what this session was about. This was, has it become the new normal so we don't talk about it? We're saying it shouldn't be the new normal, we're gonna talk about it. So that's why we're having the session, rather than that we're gonna sit around and discuss whether it's a new normal or not, which would be so boring. This is more interesting, right? Um, but you, the other point you raise, very valid. I hear Frank saying that there's a much wider cultural problem that needs to be addressed. And whilst I understand Emma's focus on young Muslims being attracted to uh, perverted versions of Islam and the Muslim community needing to speak out more, I think if we're going to uh, really win through, we need to pose it in, a broader, in broader cultural terms. So, you know, it's not just courage in relation to tackling Islamists that we need. What we find, I think, on the whole in Western society are Western leaders who back off from any debate. You know, not all of us should or want to become experts in, in Islam. We don't all need to go off and read the, the Quran as the gentleman with the flat cap over there evidently has. But what we do, what we do need to do is you know, call out our leaders when they back off from debates. You know, Tristram Hunt sat next to a school child who said he wanted to vote UKIP. What did Tristram Hunt do? He walked away. You know, that was his moment to engage. You know, there was a GM debate, the le the, our leaders walked away. And, and I, I think that's what Frank is alluding to here. What we don't, what, what we actually require is not so much a counter narrative to their narrative <laughs> as a narrative of our own. And I think that it's, it's that kind of element of courage that we need. Uh, you know, identity, no, stop, politics, stop. grievances, <laughs> they're, they're everywhere. I mean, going back to Frank's original point about the reaction to the terror attacks, and I think this... This is important to the normalisation question. I was so shocked after Manchester about how indifferent we people were to babies and children, young girls and their mothers having their bodies blown apart. And you know, I mix in academia with people who would be far more concerned very quickly after that with a random Muslim woman getting spat at or having her veil touched or being verbally insulted. Now, that's very unfair where that happens, and I've no doubt that will happen. So there's no point denying that there will be a reaction to these things. But the indifference to which uh, uh, that we have to the kind of attacks on, uh, murderous attacks on people's bodies, and these people are us. You know, when Lee Rigby had his throat slashed and his head almost hacked off, the reaction was, I mean, it was like it was a kind of partial concern over there somewhere. And the much more visceral concern is with Islamophobia. I cannot understand that. I find that so disturbing. That's way beyond the Muslim community. It's, okay. That's us. OK, thank you. you I'm very interested in the idea of courage. Uh, at work, we're told to uh, run, hide, and tell. Uh, we have an evacuation rather than the evacuation in the event of uh, an emergency like this. And an evacuation means we all cower in the basement of our building. Uh, sitting ducks, that's, that's, how I, that's how I view it, that's how we're being told to behave, rather than, I think the mayor of Tel Aviv's advice to, uh, to the citizens of Tel Aviv uh, is to fight, and actually uh, that results, that gets better results, uh, even, uh, even in the, uh, you know, during a terrorist uh, incident. Uh, you know, I think there's, uh, there's uh, the virtue of courage when it comes to uh, having the courage of your convictions, I think has already been mentioned, uh, and standing up uh, and arguing against uh, this uh, culture of gratuitous offence taking uh, on the part of people uh, who, uh, who are, uh, in, in their view, defending their, uh, their precious identity. I think that's, uh, that's quite a large part of the, of the courage which people who uh, don't feel capable of uh, 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 being physically courageous uh, 
uh, uh, could, could adopt. Well, picking up on the two previous speakers, although I don't wonder what this kind of it's us means, I'm a bit suspicious there, but I, in principle, I think very grateful for Frank's reminder that these are broader cultural issues that we're talking about, politicization of identity, identity as a medium of politics, multiculturalism, and I think the lot has to be answered for by left intellectuals who, who uh, uh, diffuse and are unwilling to defend the enlightenment values, the values of liberalism, which built this prosperity uh, engine which we have been inhabiting, and this kind of hands-off and, and oversensitivity with, 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 with criticizing cultures, and to see that the criticism of cultures and ideas, of backward and dysfunctional cultures and ideas, isn't ad hominem, but is actually helping individuals to come through and forward out of these cultures. And I think that we need to be have the courage to do, and I think so it's a very much broader cultural issues, and I agree 100% with this, that's what we can, we can discuss. I think what we can here discuss less is the intricacies of various fractions of Islam and entering a kind of discourse. It was very important to, with respect to the liberal values we stand for is that religious uh, uh, doctrines are, have no place in public discourse, that we have a secular culture, uh, but are one of tolerating various things as private. Uh, convictions and we, we have a series of moral values which aren't tied to whole worldviews, ethical worldviews, but are about to uh, able to structure a cosmopolitan discourse between different uh, worldviews which can continue. I think just one, uh, that's what I think Habermas we can learn from him. I leave it at that. C couldn't you say that there is something actually quite positive about underreacting to terror attacks? Like the guy in the London Bridge bombing who's you know, he's running away from the actual attack, but he is being careful not to spill his pint. And people like that picture because it sort of said, you know, I'm, I'm not that, but you can try and terrorize me, you're not gonna succeed. Uh, that's the first thing. So isn't there something, I'm not saying it's the most wonderful reaction ever, but isn't there something positive in it? And the second thing is, uh, ISIS, uh, like Al Qaeda before it, um, Take a, the, part of the, the appeal of the message is to say, the West talks the talk, we actually mean it. We're prepared to act on it. Now, how do you counter that? Because, you know, in, in many ways, I'm quite, I'm quite glad that the, the West um, doesn't uh, act. You know, you could say, okay, so the West is risk averse in the way it fights wars, it's a bit half-hearted, it's always looking for the exit strategy. Okay, yeah, that's a fair, that's a fair description. But it's not like I'm, I'm, I really want them to be all out in the way that they fight wars and to not have an exit and to stay there and, and for years to come. You see what I mean? So how to counter that is actually a bit, a bit more tricky than just saying, well, we've got conviction. In what? We have to have some counter okay. um, narrative to that. So the first thing I wanted to say was like not all Muslims support this idea and I think a lot of people generalize like jihadists to be like all Muslims opinions and clearly it isn't because then every Muslim would be a terrorist. But the other thing is um, with this fellow over here that started speaking about the Quran, the Quran never tells anyone to hurt innocent people. So clearly like as, uh, okay you can detest me in a Shh. second but can you, you interrupt yeah, exactly. me please? Let her finish, go on. Um, but the point is, we have like this culture of like very like anti-Islamist ideas and people are scared to be like Islamophobic, but when Katie Hopkins said, oh, I guess Ramadan came early after the Manchester bombings, well, there are people that genuinely believe that all Muslims are like bad people, hence after these disasters, like I've been personally like accused of being a terrorist or supporting this, which I don't. So I really think that that's why these terrorists are able to thrive because there's this climate of hate that's created and hate never, like hate can't win and we shouldn't let it win. So I think people should actually read the Quran and actually like understand that there's gonna always be interpretations. There's like Christian terrorists, there's Buddhist terrorists, there's gonna be terrorists. There's people that interpret religion in, a, in different ways which can be offensive and I think people need to acknowledge that. Okay, so. The judge in front of me said that his hero um, during the London Bridge attack was the guy who saved his pint. For me, the, the hero was the, was the Bill Wolf fan. Yeah. We went approached by the... Um, <laughs> we went approached by the, the guy called the terrorist, put his hands up and says, you know, I'm Neil Wolf. Yeah. come on. <laughs> and uh, Frank, if, if that's your services, get young people to say, I'm Neil Wolf to these people, I think that's what I'm about. Okay. <laughs>
argue against myself, it is a tiny, tiny number of Muslims. Jihadophobia, that would be reasonable. If you read uh, ISIS's own communications, they can't believe how few people they've managed to recruit. Given the unemployment in the Middle East, the economic uh, deprivation in the Middle East, it is remarkable you that... Look, you've spoken before. Just want to pick up on that us and then them dynamic that they were talking about. Um, it's just... It's such a divisive thing to do, and I think ranking and categorizing different levels of suffering isn't helpful in any way, and it just creates the sort of hatred that you were talking about. And yeah, it's, it's just really horrible, so. Okay, thank you. It's actually no surprise to me that um, in that debate you mentioned that they, they couldn't find anyone to speak out against someone who's actually a jihadist. Because, you know, our education system is totally you know, weakened uh, any, any possibility for that. I mean, when I was growing up, I, di I, di I didn't know about the Magna Carta and, um, you know, the Peasants' Revolt and all of these things. I had to learn about that myself in the last few years. And uh, when I was reading it, I thought, this, is re this seems really important. Shouldn't, shouldn't I overlook but learn about this in school? But, um, but I didn't. Uh, the only th other thing I would say is that um, somebody said they don't want Christianity back. Um, well, uh, you like it or not, that is the source of, uh, of your values. Um, but, well, it, it is actually. <laughs> you know, our, our values, pr you know, primarily come from the Bible. And I just think that that is, um, that is the source of your values. It's sitting there gathering dust. Nobody wants to use it. Thank you very much indeed. Right. So I would like to know what the panel's opinion is on... Um, what the effect of uh, the West intervention in the Middle East through history, specifically the Syrian war, which is, ha which is currently happening, has had on the radicalization of British Muslims? Because we've talked about, I totally identify that it's true that some uh, Muslim uh, um, uh, Islam extremists think have this, this sort of idea that they have a moral superiority. However, for a really long time, um, we may have brought those, you know, we might have tried to impose our own values into uh, the Middle East. Um, secondly, just on the comment on the, um, on, on, on Islamophobia, yeah, I don't know anybody that was not outraged of, uh, on the attacks. Like, everybody was outraged on the attacks. And I'm not saying that's any better or worse than Islamophobia, but we cannot, we cannot ignore that from these attacks, you know, Islamophobia is it's happening. And why should in people that simply just believe in Islam, why should they suffer, you know, the radicalization of someone that is extreme, extremist? So we should tackle that, of course we should, you know. I mean, I mean making a value judgment on what's worse or better, I think is, is com totally unproductive. Hi, yeah, I'm gonna start off by saying that we're all intelligent human beings and we can care about more than one thing at once. Um, and um, that's, that's really important. We don't need to choose um, what's uh, more important. But I'm gonna move on from that. And I'm going to say that as a Muslim, it's actually really difficult to talk about terrorism um, without actually people thinking that you're a terrorist um, and, um, or a terrorist sympa sympathizer. And, um, but I'm going to go ahead and, and speak about it and speak about something that's on my mind. Um, I can assure you I'm not a terrorist. Um, so uh, what we're doing is we're, putting te uh, we're, um, we're, we're making teachers police. Um, uh, children in schools. Um, what we're also doing is um, um, we're, we're targeting Muslims through Islamophobia. We're, we're, we're saying that um, when a terrorist attack happens, um, I mean, I've experienced it as well. We're saying that you're a terrorist because of it. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm born in London and I consider myself British, but I also consider myself Muslim. Um, um, but, um, and of course, I don't, I don't know which one comes first, um, but why is it that um, British-born Muslims are, are leaving and they're committing acts of terror? And, um, why, and why are we trying to understand why they're doing it? And, um, and it's not okay for us to be afraid of uh, Muslims in this country, and it's not okay to make teachers into police officers, um, but why, are we why, are we, why aren't we trying to understand terrorists the same way we understand serial killers? Um, and, that's, and that's what I want to say. Okay, thank you. I think there's been a huge amount of coverage of the people who you know, um, suffered at one level in the, in the bombings and the various attacks that took place. And the TV is replete with endless stories or revisiting how they, how they are today, how they've kind of survived, how they've managed to sort of retain their sense of dignity and so forth in the face of what happened to them. 
But the one thing that's always kind of looked for is to see that you haven't become angry uh, about you know, what has happened to you. And it seems to me that Jon Snow and all the TV coverage of what happened at Finsbury Park, just around the corner from where I live, is always to ensure that nobody is getting angry about what has happened. Uh, as a value, do you consider anger to be worthwhile as something that could, you know, that you can say people have a legitimate right to be angry? Angry doesn't have to take the form of turning into a mob. It takes the form of being prepared to be politically angry, to be kind of, you know, angry in the sense of morally angry, but that, you know, people's kind of instinctive reaction about being angry about what takes place is always sought to be kind of driven down and held down. Okay, thank you very much. Indeed. I really appreciate all of your input. I just want to say some things because I think a lot of people don't have human contact with Muslims, actually. Um, and that's normal, actually. Why would you necessarily even know that you're talking to a Muslim? Because those guys are the ones that have really assimilated and they, they're completely just like you. So you won't necessarily know you're talking to a Muslim all the time. Um, most young Muslims that I've spoken to, they didn't know the word jihad before 9-11. They didn't know that it actually meant anything. They have learned so much about their faith, like I said earlier, through our own narrative around terrorism. And so they're just as much learning about Islam as much as you are in some cases. Um, but make sure you don't dehumanize them because that is exactly what ISIS want you to do, and that is exactly what Al-Qaeda want you to do. It is about driving that division. And the fact that we live in a multicultural society allows us to avoid an echo chamber. The fact that we live in a society that has social media allows that too, if we use it properly. And so we're in a unique position to be able to break through our own prejudices. And in times of fear, we will have prejudice. It's normal. And I don't blame a lot of people who don't have human contact with Muslims to start fearing them. But you need to understand that even the young ladies that have spoken today, they have had experiences of Islamophobia, whether you think it's a real thing or not. And that is because of the backlash that comes with dehumanizing who we're dealing with. And so when we say we haven't had enough outrage, what does that outrage look like? What do you want them to do in a constructive way that is different to what you're doing? And so it's about asking those kind of questions because otherwise we're always just going to go through the same motions of and you know anger what who are we who are you going to target your anger at uh, that's the big question really because you're not going to target the anger at the terrorist you're never going to get that chance let's be frank so that that's that's my last thought really um, because I think I have a, a social responsibility even though I will talk about this and I will express where there are things that are lacking in our understanding within Muslim communities as well as outside of Muslim communities, there is a social responsibility. And that is why politicians, in the height of fear, will always try to temper anger, because that will never help our society. It will only make things worse, and it will only feed terrorist ideology. OK. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Emma. Uh, uh, Frank, your final thoughts, please. Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, I think that uh, young man there was completely wrong about the statistics on terrorism. Uh, I think what's happening at the moment is that we're tending to kind of uh, lighten the weight of uh, Islamist terrorism by suggesting that every school shooting or every individual who's got some antisocial uh, dynamic behind them who kills somebody is a terrorist. So we've kind of widened the meaning of terrorism as a way of actually avoiding discussing what is at the moment, maybe not forever, maybe not in the past, the principal problem of terrorism and that fundamental moral dishonesty about doing that. I think the question of anger is very interesting. I think Emma is right in one respect, is that, you know, who are you going to direct your anger towards? Uh, is a very difficult question when you're talking about terrorists, because you're not talking about, you know, sort of uh, an army, a visible army of individuals who you can tangibly confront. But nevertheless, I think there is something to be said about anger. I think that anger is a very important emotion in the sense of trying to create a, a more a sort of a, kind of a greater sense of responsibility and commitment for the security of our own society. I think one of the problems in British society is we draw the conclusion that security is the responsibility of a small number of individuals who happen to be working for the police, who happen to be working in the army. The rest of us can sit around, fold our arms, you know, so when call 9999, that's like our, you know, sort of uh, default kind of position. And I think that needs to be something more than that. We need to find ways of 
using our anger to create greater solidarity and also to develop a much greater commitment to working out ways in which we can secure uh, uh, our future by, by mobilizing people's uh, ideal in the public space to talk about these things, to keep it in our minds that this is something that is ever present in our memory. We're not just going to forget about it. It's not going to be merely a reaction to the last terror. We're not going to put ourselves in that passive position of continually reacting and reacting and reacting. We want to adopt a much more activist orientation to what is actually a, a fairly important and fairly regular threat that we're faced with. And I think that if we, if we can adopt that kind of a, uh, approach, then, then we'll be on a much you know, kind of better position. Uh, one final point, somebody raised the question of external intervention. I do think that Western societies have been singularly inept in what they've done in Syria. I, I think uh, uh, the Syrian intervention was basically a, a recipe for saying, how can we create a strong ISIS or Daesh there? You know, what can we do to make them as, as, as convincing as possible? We messed up in Libya. I don't know who thought of, who imagined that was a good idea to intervene in Libya in the way that we did, where we created a situation where you know, uh, what became a, a, a kind of a stable authoritarian regime was turned into a failed state, which is now threatening the whole of Africa as being imposed. We messed up in Iraq. You know, sort of when you look back upon the Iraq experience, who thought that was a brilliant idea? You know, sort of how can we create a, a vortex of reactions where the Middle East becomes even more fragmented than before? So obviously, Western societies have a lot to answer for in terms of the stupidity in the way that they've interfered in the affairs of others. But having said that, I don't think there's a connection uh, between the interventions that the West has carried out in, in, in Syria, Iraq, and elsewhere, and the homegrown problem, which I think is actually had its source within Britain, within Belgium, within France, and these societies, to do with the way that most of cultural society has been constructed. I think we've got our own problems, which we shouldn't blame on sort of inept diplomatic foreign policy interventions. I think that there's a, there's a real danger in actually lightening the moral guilt of terrorists by saying, oh, it's just a reaction to what happened in, you know, in Palestine or what happened in, in, in other part of the world, and not realize that the battle that needs to be fought, the moral battle needs to be fought, is at home. OK, thanks, Frank. <laughs> Just, just a, a, a couple of thoughts uh, to finish, which is, um, I hope that you realise that, that, that this session was never going to resolve the issue of Islamist terrorism, but actually the purpose of it, which I think was illustrated, was not kind of what's your position on what creates Islamist terrorism, but it was uh, actually to have an open and honest and frank discussion in which people could say what they thought the problem was. And so I think that those people who say, well, how can you say it was that, or I, I found what you said was unhelpful, you know, on both sides. The whole point about it is, is that we need to have this debate in society openly much more, because when people said things that people didn't agree with, the world didn't, you know, fall in on you. It actually, it was really interesting hearing all the different opinions on all sides. It's the, it's the way that this debate is actually somehow shunted to the side I, oh, you know, um, uh, Emma, you rightly made the point, you know, a lot of people don't encounter people who are Muslims in their society or they don't even know that they do. But I, I do know Muslims who feel very uncomfortable about having this discussion in Muslim communities as well as in, uh, um, in non-Muslim communities. If they have the conversation in non-Muslim communities, they feel as though they get lumped in as kind of part of the Muslim community. And when they have the conversation in the Muslim community, they get accused of being betraying the Muslim community or don't say that outside of the Muslim community. And you, you will know that when there's debates and people actually try and say, we've got a problem in our community, they get hissed by people in the Muslim community. It's like, don't say that in front of them. Now. I don't want to lump any of us together, right? I don't see people as Muslims or non-Muslims. I live in Britain. We are in this society together, and a sense of solidarity means we owe it to each other to be able to talk frankly about what's going on. And there is a problem of Islamist terrorism that we all face, that we're all threatened by, and that we all have an interest in getting rid of and solving. And the only way we're going to do that, or anywhere to get stretched anywhere near it, even despite, I like all this sort of let's have courage and run out and run it terror. I mean, do you know what I mean? I mean, it's like action man movie gone mad. Right. <laughs>
You can do that if you want, but I'll tell you what would be a bit more courageous is that we go out and have an argument after this about the importance of having this argument in the public square and not being frightened of each other or assuming that if we say something that insults somebody else's religion or somebody else's non-religion, that we're all going to kind of go into a faint. Um, we won't be offended by that, we'll learn by it. Thank you very much for coming for the Battle of Ideas.